We, we, we're seeing an uptick in crime. You can look at the news tonight. Philadelphia had, had street racers spinning around cop cars, violence going on. People are getting shot in every major city in the damn country. And crime is rising, and we're wondering why it's happening. So we have got a great guest. Larry uh, Newman serves as the president of the Missouri Alliance Professional Bail Bond Aid, uh, Agents, uh, which is an organization that promotes ethics, standards of conduct, and education for individuals involved in the business of bail bonds. He also serves on the state and federal legislative committee of the Professional Bail, ba uh, bail bond Agents uh, in the United States. He's got a breadth of knowledge in terms of what's going on with crime and the bail reform issues in our country. So without further ado, Larry Newman, what's going on, buddy? Good evening, everybody. Larry, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, and then we'll, we'll ask some more questions and see if uh, see if there's some stuff that we may even be able to pull from the crowd. So go ahead, Larry, the floor is yours. Sure. Um, I was uh, deputy sheriff in, in southwest Missouri for a number of years, and uh, I left that and opened my bail bond business, and I work in the courts with the judges and the prosecutors uh, and with law enforcement. And uh, we provide accountability to the court uh, in that to anyone that's released uh, with a promise to show up for court, um, we make sure that they do. And uh, that's our job, that's that's what we do and, and trying to provide that accountability. Uh, I served as a volunteer with probation and parole counseling offenders uh, for about six years during that time. And uh, I left uh, I left that volunteer gig because the rules come down and said we can no longer penalize those um, defendants that break the rules. So uh, when you have no accountability and uh, no uh, penalty for bad behavior, that's what you're seeing. Yeah, yep. so I know you're Missouri based, so I, I'll ask you about this. So in Missouri, it appears though homicides were up 26.5% in 2020 compared to a year earlier, according to State Highway Patrol. Uh, Patrol. So gun related crim charge, uh, uh, criminal charges are up over 100%. And so far in 2021, more than 8,000 firearms related crimes, 200 homicides have reported, and nearly three fourths of them involving the use of a gun. Crime is up. Obviously, you guys are talking about it. You guys see more, but what what are your guys' discussion? I know you just kind of mentioned why. What what is it? Are you seeing across the board in terms of policy leadership? Why are crimes up so drastically? Well, in Missouri in 2019, the Missouri Supreme Court justices changed the rules that local judges could enforce, and a lot of those rules had to do with uh, a lack of accountability. Uh, releasing people on serious crimes uh, with no uh, nothing more than a promise to show up for court uh, and please don't do it again. And uh, I know from my past experience in law enforcement and now working in the criminal justice system, um, that's that's just a, a promise and a lot of hot air. Um, you talked about Philadelphia. Um, the stats are there. Uh, at the exact same time that Philadelphia released a large number of people from their jails, crime spiked and continued to spike. Uh, serious crime, felonies, um, crimes against persons. So it, it's all about accountability, uh, the penalty, every state, uh, federal law in the United States has a penalty attached to it when it's passed so that it ensures that that, uh, that law will be obeyed. Well, now we've taken that penalty and chucked it out the door. So uh, these these people who are predators and, and uh, commit serious crimes and, and against persons and society know that there is no penalty. So that, that bad behavior is gonna continue and escalate. Gotcha. Casey, do you got a question for uh, Larry again? Yeah. So I'm curious, like from what you're observing and what you're seeing, we are definitely, I, my observing, my observations seems like the way we're handling the judicial system and treating everybody by letting them off because our prisons are full, our, our jails are full, those type of things. 
Do you see that that is adding to the problem with us not actually holding people accountable for their mis- what they do wrong? That's the direct reason that you zeroed in on it. That is exactly the reason crime is going up. There's no penalty. Why should I not commit a crime and go steal something that I want or beat somebody up because there's no penalty? I'm, I might get arrested and taken to jail, but I'm out within a couple of hours. And with a promise to go to court, and hey, there's nobody to make sure I go to court, so I back out on the street doing it again. So just to we, add to we, that a little bit, California, California, I believe, made it a law that if you steal anything under like 500 bucks, it, it is not criminal. Dollars. Is it a thousand? It yeah, is no longer thousand. criminal. It's a thousand. Um, thanks for everybody correcting me, but under a thousand dollars, and it's no longer correct uh, criminal. Do you see that's going to add to this and make this worse? The, the law changed in California, but before the law changed, the prosecutors came out and said, we're not going to prosecute it. Yep. Look at uh, Harris County, Texas, uh, and down in, in uh, Houston. The <clears> prosecutor <throat> said, we're just not going to prosecute people. We're not going to prosecute them for walking into your store, taking $1,000 worth of your property, Walking out, police aren't going to arrest them. Prosecutors not going to charge them. If the prosecutor doesn't charge them, a judge never sees it. So, is Missouri Kevin your mic again? Wow, probably can't have nice things. Off. I'm shocked. <laughs> so I'll, ask the, I'll ask a question that kind of is, is kind of an interim here, which is. Um, th- you know, some of these things, right? So you, when, when we have people, you know, I'll speak specifically to California because that's where I just left and where, um, you know, we had tremendous amounts of issues. And, and to Casey's point, they were these um, things that were, you know, small petty theft that became from petty theft to, well, sky is kind of the ceiling interpretation where you literally would have people walking in with calculators to say, what is the dollar amount that I'm walking out with? And, and you know, they just push them out the door and they're gone, right? So one of the, so one of the questions I, I, I would have um, that, that, is, that is interesting to me, and I'm sure there's a lot of statistics around it, but knowing that you've been in the field, what are you seeing from a recidivism standpoint? Like how many of these people are the same offender time and time again? Um, not new offenders, not people who have rehabilitated, but... Like, would you say that percentage has increased substantially? Is it about the same as it's always been? Give, give me kind of a feel on that. Uh, I think the percentage has, has increased a little bit. Um, it Historically, 25% or let me back up. 25 people in any jurisdiction account for 80% of the crime. Mm. You remove those 25 to 30 people and your crime drops 75 to 80%. That's always been historic that's when we had accountability now things are different because there's no accountability so the number of offenders has increased in numbers of crime dramatically increased Mm. they commit small crimes and find out that that court's just a part of their daily life uh they go show up and then they go home and do what they want to and uh so there are there's more and more people committing crime. So so the, more than recidivism, it's it's opportunistic crime and just yeah. more people being willing to do that. I think it's both. Okay. You got both. So as a- Kevin, you are absolutely killing me with the microphone. He's pretty, think- but he's not overly smart. I, I think he's speechless. Yeah, it's, it has to be. Well, I'll, I'll ask the question about, um, you know, we've been talking about the lack of accountability, but when it comes to the defund, the the police, it, it, you, I'm sure you speak to a lot of police officers in Missouri area, Illinois, Chicago, all that. Area, what are you seeing in terms of police officers wanting to just be done with their job? I recently had a conversation with the cop. It's like, I'm done. Like, it's not worth it right now. There's too much crime. It's too dangerous. And even if I try to get involved, I get in trouble for it. So what are you hearing from the police officers as part of the quote unquote defund the police movement? Well, I go back 20 years ago. And, and when I was a deputy sheriff, it wasn't for the money. I can make a lot more money doing something else. Um, I'm seeing that more now. They're, 
The police <laughs> officers that are staying in the business are there because they're there to help the people. Mm -hmm. They're there to help protect the public. That's what they want to do. More and more, they're being handcuffed. They're not being allowed to do that. Um, and it's tough, um, especially, like I said, every one of them can go out and make more money doing mm -hmm. something else. So it's a calling. You're down to the people that actually have a calling to serve the public. Yeah. Can you hear Kevin, me? Let's, Kevin, let's give it a shot. Give it a shot. Go ahead. Don't touch any wires. Go ahead. No. What the hell? He's fired. So I, I have another question, and I apologize if, if you don't have experience with this being in Texas. I'm curious what your thoughts would be. But if you go to break into a cannabis store to where it is legalized and you take a bunch of cannabis, does that change the situation? No, it doesn't change the situation. You're taking someone else's property. That, that's okay. stealing. Uh, but if it's I, under a thousand dollars, it's still stealing. If it's under a thousand dollar limit in that state, do you think that would fall under any drug laws of any way? Uh, now you're talking about federal laws, which I'm not versed in. Maybe we can get Evan to do that when he gets out of law school. Maybe. Maybe. Can you, can you... No. Every time you start talking, we hear you for a word and then you stop. How about we try no headphones? This is this is lovely, Kevin. This is why we can't have nice things. Literally, Kevin's never had audio problems, just overall brain problems. But there we go. Try it again. I, I think I heard you. No. All right. Kevin's fired. All right, Kevin. <laughs> good luck with that. Uh, all right. So we've talked. Uh, there's a couple of things you also talk about in terms of um, just in terms of major cities. And, you know, we look at what's going on in Chicago and from, you know, an easy ask you some really great questions just in terms of, uh, you know, the repeat offenders and such. How do you see this getting fixed, Larry? Uh, our state legislators need to stand up and if they don't have the laws, they need to pass the laws that force the judges in that state to follow the statutes. In Missouri, we had a Supreme Court rule change in 2019 that really created a havoc uh, for letting people go. Uh, you base your uh, bond amount on whether they can afford it or not. And it's, and with our industry, it's never the defendant that pays the bond fee anyway. It's the family. It's, we've got the family, we've got uh, the mom, dad, the employer, friends, everybody else that helps to enforce that uh, accountability. And the judges took that away. They said, let everybody out. If they, if they walk into this, a person can literally steal tens of thousands of dollars of property, get caught, walk in front of the judge and tell the judge, judge, I don't have any money or, or any way to get any money. And so the judge is forced to let them go for free with a promise to appear. And they're out within hours and back on the street doing what they're doing. What's your thought process on, on kind of the crime and people coming through the border? I know it's kind of a federal situation or a Texas thing. Um, and the way that we're treating that from a justice system perspective, is that kind of synonymous with the way we've just given up on actually punishing crime across the country? I don't know that it's given up because the citizens haven't given up. Um, there's... Uh, the movement that is that is pushing the judges to be lenient is out there and it's going to be out there we have to have law makers legislators uh, representatives and senators who will stand up pass a law and that says that the court must enforce the laws as they're written on the books there's a penalty you commit a you commit a crime that has a five-year Department of Corrections penalty, then that needs to be what it is. And instead of judges saying, oh, well, we'll just let you go on probation and promise not to do it again and turn them out the door the same day. 
Kevin, give it one, give it one shot here. What do we got? Let's find out. Can you hear me? It was the head, it was the headphones. I knew it was the headphones. Well, I have to figure out what's going on. I think I have something running in the background that keeps grabbing them. But um, so the question I have is: first and foremost, is Missouri a stand your ground state, a castle doctrine state, a make my day state? Is it? Does it have those kinds of laws? Yes, it does. How come? What What would happen if the citizens started exercising the right to protect their property in these cities? Uh, you mean like happened in St. Louis? Yeah, I, I, yeah, to an extent, yeah. But yeah, I, okay, well, we're looking. You know, we look at that situation in St. Louis where a couple was defending their property from people who had broke onto their property. They were trying to get them to leave and they wouldn't leave. Uh, we have castle doctrine and it's up to the prosecutors and the judges. Um, I had a conversation in court today with a uh, court worker that um, counsels uh, offenders. And that conversation was the same, same thing that I'm hearing everywhere else. P prosecutors are not standing up and saying, I want justice for the victim. Yeah. And when the prosecutors aren't and the judges aren't, we're all left hanging. Castle mm -hmm. doctrine or not, if you're in the wrong jurisdiction and you got the wrong prosecutor, uh, you, the castle doctrine may not protect you. I mean, you would think that if there was video evidence of someone taking prop property, getting warned and getting shot, that even if they didn't want to, that there's nothing they can do about the fact that that's a just application of the law. That at, even if the district court says, hey, no, that's that doesn't apply, that there is no extent to which that that case can go up at which some point is it's not going to be deemed self-defense because that's what it is. You have you either have the right to defend your property, your private property, or you don't. And do you think that what is actually happening here is the abdication or the um, destruction of the idea of a right to private property? Now you're getting a little above my paper. <laughs> um, the effect that I'm seeing is uh, they still talk about the person's right to their property, to their home. Um, in effect, when someone, if someone broke into your house tonight, Kevin, while yeah. you're asleep, assaulted you, threatened you, take your property, okay, they can be arrested taken to the jail, processed, and released by the judge, promised to appear. They can go in tomorrow in front of the judge, plead guilty. The judge will sentence them to, let's say, five years, as an example, and then suspend that sentence and put you on probation and release you today saying, okay, Kevin, you need to go uh, check in with your probation officer tomorrow and promise not to do this again. I mean, first, it would be very hard to get a dead body in front of a judge um, <laughs> because, you know, I'm not advocating that. OK, but <laughs> well, no, if someone breaks into my house and assaults me, they're not getting out alive. That's that's my right as an individual, my right as an individual. If someone is going to violate my property like that. I have every right to take whatever step I deem necessary to defend my right, defend my life. Stop um, and, that. But that is that that's what it's coming down to, though, is that people are forgetting that very fact. This is my property. You do not have a right to my property. The question is not to be asked of me. Is your life worth the hundred fifty or two hundred dollars worth of stuff you're stealing? That's the question you ask yourself. Is my life worth the, this theft? Because that's what's on the line right now. If I, I went mean, into that thinking that it was my responsibility to make that decision about my own theft, you know, it would be a lot higher because like you start to realize, wait a second, he has every right to put a, put a bullet in my head and that's his right. Therefore, I'm the one now saying, I thought that this was worth my life. Um, the, and I think the, we're people that protect, the people that protect you, the people that are in the system to protect you is the prosecutor. They yeah. prosecute the uh, offenders on behalf of the victims, whether it's an individual or if it's society. And yeah. then it's the judge who sets the sentence. So a combination of prosecutors who refuse to prosecute this case, or if they do prosecute it, and the judge deems to be uh, very lenient and say, promise to do it again and I'll let you go. Um, those are the two people in the system that are there to protect us. If we lose them, 
if they deem that they are not going to enforce the castle doctrine as it's called then who do you turn to and that's thankfully hopefully we have lawyers within the system that are going to be willing to take that case on because so long as castle doctrine is law it you just take it to the next level wherein it's it's if it is law there's nothing they can do about it and thankfully that's how it's supposed to work but unfortunately it doesn't seem to necessarily be the case anymore that that the, those within the judicial system themselves although there is for everyone watching and wondering like what happens if you take it to the next level donald trump did make it a personal point of his to appoint as many legitimate constitutionalists as humanly possible within the judicial system and fill those holes so yes we do need to so understand are, that there are judges in place to defend us yeah so one of the questions i i wanted to ask of you larry is if you kind of have a pulse on this um are are the judges who and and you know to your point this is a this is both a prosecutor and a judge problem we have prosecutors not willing to prosecute to the fullest extent of the law um and and a lot of that i think is driven by budget restrictions resources um and and, and just kind of the like um but but one of the questions i wanted to ask is you know in in your opinion um uh, is there a difference uh, based in, in, in any sort of way that you can calculate or see um, or even perceive maybe is the better way to look at it is, are there a difference in the appointed judges versus the elected judges and their willingness to uphold the law in their courtrooms? Well, your county circuit and uh, district judges, your local level judges are elected judges. Right. And I will say that all of the judges that I know really would like to get back to where they have the ability to to set some uh, some decent uh, sentences. Um, would, would it be when you get, would it, get ahead, to sir. the state Supreme Court, those are appointed positions. Okay? And there's there's where the problem lies because when the Supreme Court justices change the rules, the mm. rules are handed down to all of the circuits and the circuits must obey. Thank you. I, and I, I appreciate you pointing that out because that was, that was kind of one of the points that, uh, that concerns me most is a, you have prosecutors who are working off of public budgets um, who, who may be constrained for resources when it comes to prosecuting. Um, and secondary to that is that the elected judges, although ele are elected to uphold the law, are sometimes constrained by the uh, circuit court judges that are appointed, not elected. Um, and, I, and, I, and I think that's an important distinction to make just because sometimes people don't understand how people arrive at conclusions in court cases. And when you have to work off of a, um, a, a statement written from a circuit court judge that was appointed um, in a county where um, you're basically, your, your hands are bound now as a judge between what the circuit courts want and what the people who elected you ultimately want, um, and I and I want to I wanted to kind of just draw that linear picture because I think people um, have some misunderstanding sometimes of how the judicial system works, uh, particularly in the prosecutorial um, arena. Yeah. Um, the most of your elected judges and and I and I'm going off of my experience here most of my judges in the southwest missouri area are republican judges and they are they want to uphold those statutes and they want to enforce the law and and deliver the penalties that the law calls for but they're restricted by the supreme court justices in missouri who are appointed by the missouri bar association they do have to be signed off on by the governor uh, but the governor is uh, definitely on the same side as we are. He's a former sheriff. So he sees the same problem that, that I see. Uh, I've had uh, many discussions with him on that. So the Missouri plan that was touted to be so great has turned out to be in a, in a state that is 75% of the legislature is Republican all of the all of the Supreme Court justices are uh, liberal Democrats, and so you don't get um, the ability to oversee those justices at the ballot box. 
So that's why I say this is this goes back to the legislature. The representatives and senators can stand up and say that we're taking away the uh, by the viability of the Missouri Supreme Court to set rules that do not conform with statutes. That's what needs to happen. The, the legislature needs to stand up and take control. 100%. And I, I'm curious on your perspective. Um, ever since privatizing prisons and actually pushing that out of our system, do you think that has been more of the issue in, a, in us not making a logical decision and just making a quick decision around money? And this, a lot of credit to SUNY. She kind of triggered that in her comment there, but um, there's no money in rehab, rehabbing people. Um, but if we keep that um, prison pipeline going and keeping that money flowing, do you see that as influencing the decisions from the judges because they could be influenced by alternative means? I don't, I don't know that that would influence the judges. Um, your original question to me was how, how do we get this back on track? Unfortunately, it's going to take a lot of prison space because we have to prove to these people on the street that if they commit a crime, if they violate state statute, they're going away for a while. And where are we going to put them? Uh, that is a definite lar definitely large obstacle that we have to overcome. But now we're back to the legislature again. I was going to say a, another big part of a part of the issue is uh, the amount of crimes that people are actually able to be arrested for is a lot of times uh, a huge issue. So, you know, you have you have things like victimless crimes, which is an oxymoron and it's, at, you know, at its very core. But people are still going to prison for these things. Why do you think it would be better if the prosecution just decided all we're going to prosecute are violence against people and property crimes? Because, you know, non Nonviolent, you know, victimless crimes should not be, no one should be wasting their time on that kind of stuff. Well, that's not working so far. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, There's a victim and in all of these. It, it, you may want to call it an oxymoron, but a victimless crime is, is, there is no such thing. Uh, yeah. If it is a crime, if there's a statute and it is a crime, the victim is either an individual or society. Well, a lot of times oh, every crime well. that every crime that's in the statute is has a victim. Or yeah, or yeah. I I, I disagree with that though. Yeah, no. Because a victimless crime, so if someone is caught, let's say someone is caught smoking cannabis here in Utah and they do not have a medical card and they are just caught smoking it, now it's a crime, but they harmed no one but themselves. Yeah. Is there is it a statute that you can't uh, possess marijuana? Well, that's, that's there's a, yeah, but there's no there victim. Commit, then, yeah. then there is a victim. It is society. Well, no, because at the end of the day, um, the victim is the person whose life is going to be ruined. But that's the thing is that we have prosecutors that are overworked in legal systems where they don't, even if they wanted to, there is not enough time in the world for them to actually address these crimes. I know that for public defenders, they get on average about 11 minutes per docket that's placed before them. That's right. If you get a public defender, you get 11 minutes. Um, how much worse is it going to be when, uh, when you're looking at the prosecutor side where their responsibility is actually determining what should be charge what what should actually be viewed as a crime so if the only if the only victim you can point to is me putting something in my body which oh by the way is the whole debate over the over the v thing um how putting people in jail for 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 marijuana is just going to add an undue burden that for for every person that's being prosecuted for marijuana that's another person that can't be prosecuted for theft or can't be prosecuted for battery or something that actually uh, needs to be focused on. It seems to me right. that prosecuting that that marijuana crime is actually a bigger harm to society than than allowing it to be. And so maybe something looking at what's being punished. Well, I, and trying I to think there's a, there's something yeah. to be said about striking a balance, right? So each yeah. state has its ability to make its own legislation. I think there are Very certain true. laws that we can look at now that particularly you know these prohibition style laws. We know that they are 
uh, at best a, a cash grab, right? And 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 that's that's th- that is the unfortunate part of it is that the 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 hardest hit victim is typically the person being prosecuted in that circumstance. Now, I think one of the things that is is extremely important to stress that I think Larry is kind of getting at is that if you when you have people who think it's okay to steal, rob, cheat, break into, harm other people. I think we need to be very tough on those crimes right now. I think is and and, and Larry, you're absolutely uh, you know correct me if I'm wrong in in surmising, but there are there is there is petty crime that I think we can all agree that there are particularly like with cannabis laws and like I said these prohibition style things um, that that are absolutely cumbersome on our system and they create that opportunity for free market enterprise particularly in the in the in the prison system that encourages kind of what Casey was talking about you know as a pipeline to prison but when it comes to hard crime when it comes to you know people um, you know committing gun crimes let's then I want to be very clear gun crimes are different than gun use um, and I want to speak very specifically like when you have assault you have battery you have you know theft um, you have you have crimes that truly do impact whether it's a business or an individual um, but but truly have an impact outside of the individual that it is incumbent upon us as a society right now to be hard on those on those specific yeah. penalty crimes. Now, um, again, I will I will limit that debate to I disagree with it from a prohibitionist standpoint. Um, I think that drug crimes are probably one of the the only areas I can point to that um, you're you're doing most harm to yourself and and to to relatively yeah. no one else. And that's yeah. because of a market solution that is not in play right now. But everything else, I believe, we do need to take a hard stance on. And, and I just want to clarify real quick, the point I'm making isn't that weed itself should be legal. The point I'm making is even if weed itself is illegal, a prosecutor can only look at so many cases in a day. If there's a if there's 100 crimes and a prosecutor can only look at 25 of them in a day and actually do something about 25 of them, well, if a third of them are what where the only person that's actually getting harmed is the person themselves, cutting that out makes it significantly easier for the prosecutor to actually be able to pursue those crimes that that really do need the toughest of punishment. That's that's the point I'm making from a pure numbers perspective. Would it make more sense to start looking at punishing those the the victim the crimes with the victim versus the ones where the victim is the self? Well, you, okay, there's a whole lot there to go through, guys. Um, but let's start with this: if if we as society, as, as you and I, as voting members of society send our legislators up there and say, hey, we don't want to prosecute these low-level crimes, these these nonviolent or no-victim crimes. So get to your state capitol, take that statute that makes that a crime and get rid of it. Ease that up on the prosecutor. That eases up on the prosecutor. If it's no longer a crime, he can't prosecute it. So take that away. Now, as, as far as the gun question, it doesn't matter whether it's a gun, a knife, a baseball bat, um, a piece of chain. If you're going to kill somebody, you're going to kill somebody with whatever. So the issue of, about assault, which is the attack on someone, is is that a serious crime that we're going to put a stop to or are we going to let the guy back out on the street so that he knows that the next time he does it, hey, he can do it worse. He can kill somebody. And it's no big deal. So that that's kind of where we're at. But from the law enforcement perspective, where I where I my background is, there there was low level crimes like smoking marijuana. Okay, if you want to do that, that's fine. If it's not a crime, then if you don't want it to be a crime, if you don't want the prosecutor belly down with all those cases, then the legislators need to eliminate that from the criminal statutes and it's gone so now you've solved that problem so yeah i i have one last question uh if you could because you you brought up the uh the republican judges in your area from a partisan level and then we'll wrap up the segment um from a partisan level you know, you mentioned it's obviously a little bit more, a little harder on crime if they are conservative judges or Republican judges. It, 
Are you seeing that in the conversations in this across the country? Is that is that just kind of the way it is right now where the Democrat judges are light on crime and the conservative judges are a little bit harder on crime, which will clean up the problem that we think that we have? Do you see a big partisan split? Um, no, not at your local level. Um, and, and I could talk about all of the judges that I am familiar with and that I know that I work with on a daily basis. I can't talk about those judges in different parts of the state of a different political philosophy. All I'm saying is that politics needs to be out of it. If it's a crime, sentence them. They, they serve their full sentence. And if that doesn't work, then the legislature needs to get back to work. Actually, then let me follow that up real fast because that brings up the better point. Politics should be out of it. Then the question becomes, why has politics been brought into the judicial system when it should not be? Why do you, why do you think that? What do you think the purpose behind that is? Uh, you're getting, now you're getting into some deep water. Um, the, I, I, from a national level, I can't really speak on that. I can talk to you about what's going on in Missouri and places and places around the nation. Um, but it's, but up at the atmosphere where you're talking about now, um, I, I don't have an answer for that. I know that the information that gets fed to judges at their conferences uh, is definitely a um, a lenient, uh, very lenient, very progressive, liberal uh, attitude. So they come back and they've heard all this. And then when I, I sit down with a judge that I've never met before and I explain to them or a legislature, legislator that I've never talked to before. And I sit down and we explain the criminal justice system to them so that they can understand it. They say, oh, I get it now. Okay. Now I understand why you're needed and why we need to, we need to get tough. So the information that they're being fed um, in places where they go for training is a big problem. I think that was a good answer. I know Suni's in agreement. She's uh, we've been in the private chat, and she just thinks it's. I mean, this is the, the issues we have with the judicial system is all about issues of money, people trying to keep their jobs, trying to you know be elected, and and just drastic flaws. And it's not just partisan. It's it's this new woke culture being entered into the judicial branch of this country, which is horrific. Larry, you have been fantastic. Do you have any final words before we, we go to our uh, our our next topic? Uh, you guys are great. I'm very impressed. Keep it up. Well, thank you so much, Larry. Uh, and again, uh, Elliot always sends us great people. So thanks for being on the show. Enjoy. And uh, we'll, we'll hope maybe catch you another time. All right. All right. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank Bye, you. you too. Hi, Larry. Hi, Larry. That was, uh, that was a good sign. Elliot, this, I don't know how Elliot found me, but he always finds really, really good people. So.